In this video, we'll be going over the 10 most powerful player character races in D&D 5e. Basically, the ones that are pretty stacked with a whole bunch of useful racial traits. And at number 10, we have the Cobalt from Volo's Guide to Monsters. Now, first off, I should probably mention, the Cobalt no longer has negative stats like it previously did, so its ability score increase is just a pure plus two dexterity with no other negatives. It even has the full 30 feet of movement speed despite being a small size, whereas most small size races have a 25 feet move speed. So it doesn't really lose out on any negative benefits there. And with the new customizing your origin rule, you can always change that plus two dexterity to any other stat, just as long as it stays a plus two and you don't distribute it in some other weird way. Now, why is the Cobalt on this list? Well, because of its pack tactics and its special trait, Grovel, Cower, and Beg. Pack tactics allows the Cobalt to have advantage on creatures if an ally is within five feet of that creature. So basically, if you have any of your allies in melee range with you, you're always going to have advantage on your attacks, which is huge for a player character to actually have the ability of. You could even proc this yourself if you just have a companion nearby or if you're a Beastmaster Ranger riding on your animal companion. Since the Cobalt is a small race, that's something you can technically do. And pack tactics is definitely the best part about the Cobalt. It's one of the strongest singular racial features of the game, but obviously not that strong since there's nine other races above it on this list. And it has another ability called Grovel, Cower, and Beg, where once per short or long rest, you can use your action in order to activate the ability, which causes your character to pathetically cower and cry, which gives your allies advantage on all nearby enemies within 10 feet of you and that can see you. And what's great about this ability is there's no saving throw for it. So you can just use this on a big bad evil guy and just give all of your allies advantage on their attacks for a full round. Although you do have to basically give up your turn in order to use it, but it's a really nice buff for the rest of the party, especially on something that's just a racial, whereas most of the time racials are kind of minor and not that useful in combat. Although you might get the opposite impression after watching this video with how many good racials there are in these top 10. And lastly, the Cobalt does have a downside, where it technically has sunlight sensitivity, so it has disadvantage on attack rolls if it's in direct sunlight, as well as perception checks, which can be pretty bad if you're always out in the open in a campaign. However, most dungeons take place underground, or inside buildings, so chances are this won't be that much of a detriment. I played a Cobalt in a desert setting campaign, a setting where you can't really get any more sunny than that, and rarely had sunlight sensitivity activate, because even then we were inside most of the time. And of course, the Cobalt has dark vision, which is an excellent trait for races to have. So when you're inside, you can see up to 60 feet in dark with little issues. And at number nine, we have the Warforge from Eberron Rising of the Last War. This mechanical race is basically a robot light and doesn't really have one benefit that's better than pack tactics but it is kind of stacked with a whole bunch of really good minor benefits, in addition to basically a plus one AC bonus that's a lot easier to use than other racial plus one AC bonuses, where you just kind of get it all the time. The Warforge has the ability called Integrated Protection, which allows you to spend an hour to don your armor and basically meld it into your body, granting you the bonuses of whatever armor you're wearing, assuming you're proficient in that armor, and the armor cannot be removed against your will as long as you're alive. In addition to that, on the same trade, it also just gives you a flat plus one bonus to your armor class, which is really useful. It also has another ability called Constructed Resilience, where it just has a whole bunch of benefits baked into it. It gives you resistance to poison damage, makes you immune to diseases, gives you advantage on saving throws against the poison condition, you don't need to eat, drink, breathe, or sleep, and also magic can't put you to sleep. There are some other racials in the game that prevent you from being put to sleep as well, and there's some aquatic races that give you a form of underwater breathing, but the Warforge just kind of gets all that as well, and it doesn't need to breathe, so it doesn't care if it's underwater. That might actually make the Warforge a good race to pick if you're doing an aquatic campaign, because it has a lot of other benefits that are useful in addition to having underwater breathing by way of not needing to breathe. They also get a skill and tool proficiency in whatever you want, so you can pick up thieves tools as your proficiency with your racial without having to worry about getting a class or background that has it. And you can just pick a proficiency whatever power stat you want, as most other races only give you an option to pick a proficiency in a handful of different skills. Although with the customizing your origin rule, you can be flexible with this on any other race as well. And it even has benefits when it's resting, because with their centuries rest ability, 
They do need to stay motionless for at least six hours during a long rest, but they're not unconscious and they can see and hear as normal, which means you can basically be a lookout during a long rest without having to actually sleep. So the Warforge is just a fool of a whole bunch of small good benefits. You can see why I put it above the Cobalt, despite the fact that none of its abilities are technically as good as Pack Tactics, maybe that plus one AC bonus, but it has so many good abilities that it definitely deserves a spot on this list. And funny enough, the official version of the Warforge is actually the nerfed version. It was even stronger when it was in the testing stages in 5e. And at number eight, we have the Mountain Dwarf. When you pick the Dwarf, there's about five different subclasses you can pick from, assuming you have all the books. And the Mountain Dwarf from the good old regular player's handbook has a really good distinction about it that really separates it from the rest of them. In that, it has the ability to pick a plus two ability score increase to two of its ability scores instead of just one. Now, normally a race will give you about three extra ability score increases, and it's usually a plus two in one of the main stats for the race, and then a plus one in something else. With the customize your origin rule, this can just be a plus two to your best stat and then a plus one to your second best stat. But with the Mountain Dwarf, and of course the customize your origin rule, this becomes a plus two to your best stat and your second best stat. And it's the only race in the game that's able to give you a plus two to two of your stats instead of just one of them. And that's the strongest part of the Mountain Dwarf, if using the customize your origin rule. Without the rule, instead you get a plus two to your constitution and a plus two to strength, which is also good for certain classes. Anyways, outside of the really good ability score increase, the dwarf is also just full of a whole bunch of minor useful abilities as well. The dwarf has dark vision, resistance to poison damage and advantage on saving throws against poison, and the mountain dwarf even gives you an extra proficiency in light and medium armor. So if you want to wear medium armor and be a spellcaster, the mountain dwarf is a good way to pick that up and get good stats. Although there is a negative to the Mountain Dwarf, it only has 25 movement speed, so it's 5 speed slower than normal races. But it gives you the ever important plus 2 and 2 stats, which makes it a really good choice numbers wise, and definitely lets it take a spot on this list. The other ones above the Mountain Dwarf all beat it by virtue of just having one or two overpowered abilities, or having a collection of really powerful abilities, like the next spot on this list. And at number seven, we have the Protector Asimar. The Asimar has three different subclasses you can pick when you have Volo's Guide to Monster, but even without adding on the subclass features, it's still a really good pick. You see, the Asimar has a trait called Celestial Resistance, which gives you resistance to two types of damage, Necrotic and Radiant, which makes the Asimar the only racial to grant two resistances to damage types, when it's already really good to get a single resistance to a damage type from a racial. Although, depending on the campaign, you might never encounter necrotic or radiant damage, or you might encounter it all the time. This could be considered a niche pick depending on your game, but getting two resistances from a racial is actually kind of big. Also, it has dark vision, which is just kind of standard. You get negative points if you don't have dark vision with your racial. And it has another really good ability called Helping Hands, which basically allows you to, once a day, heal the target that you can touch by an amount equal to your level. Now, any amount of healing is good, because in D&D you can stop a friendly target from doing death saving throws by just giving them any amount of healing, and having an emergency heal to use, even if it does require a touch range, is only a benefit. Even if you only heal one hit point at level one, that's still really good from a racial. And I think there's only one other racial in the game that gives you a heal, and that's the halfling mark of the healing, which gives them a free use of the cure wound spell once a day. Although that's not all for the Asimar. Once we also add in the sub-race things, it gets a little bit better. The Protector subclass will grant the SMR an extra 1 to their Wisdom score, which can be a plus 1 to do anything if you use Customize Your Origin, and then it goes on to have the ability called Radiant Soul, which they can use once they hit 3rd level, and basically as an action gives you a 30 foot fly speed for a minute. And while you have this fly speed, the first attack you do to one target on your turn deals extra Radiant damage equal to your level. So if you're level three, you'll do an extra three radiant damage with your first attack that lands on one target in a turn, as long as it was from an attack or a spell. Now, this extra damage is nice, but the real benefit from this is on the on-demand fly speed you get for a minute, because fly speed in DED is actually super useful, to the point where Adventures League bans races that have innate fly speed, like the Arakakra. There are just so many useful applications to flight speed that being able to get it from a racial is a really nice bonus to have. 
The fact that the Ace of Bar can get this on top of two resistances and a once a day free heal is like icing on the cake. It doesn't lose any ASIs for all these benefits either, as it has the full plus two and plus one you can pick. Nor does it have a decreased movement speed or really any kind of negatives, as it even has dark vision. And at number six, we have the Aarakocra. The Aarakocra only has a 25 movement speed of walking, but as long as you aren't wearing medium or heavy armor, they have a 50 foot fly speed. And because of this one feature, Aarakocras are banned in Adventures League. That's because fly speed is really good in all tiers of play, especially since the speed doesn't really have any drawbacks besides the kind of armor you can wear. You can get the full 50 feet of fly speed and attack with your weapon, or stay in the air out of reach of melee attacks. A level 1 Aarakocra with a plus 1 longbow can solo a Tarrasque, because the Tarrasque will just never be able to hit it. Granted, it would take a really long time, but it is technically possible because the Aarakocra would just never take damage and eventually land enough attacks to down the Tarrasque. The Aarakocra is this high on this list exclusively for that innate fly speed. It's also the fastest flyer out of all the races that have a fly speed, with a 50 feet of movement. This also makes it the fastest race baseline, as the second fastest base movement speed is from the Centaur, who has 40 feet of base movement speed. Even the Tabaxi can't match the Aarakocra's fly speed, because it can only double its movement speed once before it has to stop for a full turn if it wants to use its feline agility again. So in a single round of combat, the Tabaxi is technically faster, but the Aarakocra can outspeed everything else, and with fly speed, which is much better than land speed. Now, the Aarakocra does have some other racials, but they're not really worth talking about. The great thing about the rest of its racials is that none of them are negative, although none of them are overly positive either. The whole reason this race is on this list is 100% because of its fly speed. And at number 5, we have the Winged Tiefling variant. Now, the Tiefling race has a whole bunch of sub-races, probably more than any other race, and one of its sub-races is called the Winged variant, which basically gives them bat-like wings, and as long as you aren't wearing heavy armor, gives you a 30-foot fly speed. Although the wings do come at a cost, if you take the variant, then you lose the Infernal Legacy trait. Infernal Legacy is actually a pretty decent racial trait as well, as it gives you access to three spells as you level up. At level 1 you get Thaumaturgy, at level 3 you get Hellish Rebuke that you can cast at second level, and at level 5 you gain the Darkness spell. And the spells which have a spell slot associated to them can be cast once a day each for free. So you're basically giving up Hellish Rebuke and Darkness for fly speed, and that's a very worthwhile trade-off. Especially as this fly speed allows you to actually use medium armor, where the Aarakocra can't. They both can't fly with heavy armor though. But in addition to having fly speed, it still keeps all of its other racials, which means hellish resistance that gives it fire resistance, one of the most common types of damage in the game. And of course it has dark vision, whereas the Aarakocra doesn't have dark vision, which is kind of a negative to the Aarakocra. So because the Winged Tiefling has fire resistance and dark vision, that places it slightly above the Aarakocra who can technically fly a little bit faster but it still has access to 30 feet of fly speed at all times, which is still good, while also having slightly better other racials. And there are only two races that have access to permanent fly speed, which is why both of them make the top 10 list. And at number four, we have the Seder from the mythical Odyssey of Theros. For the top four spots, the only reason these races beat out fly speed is because they're kind of broken. The Seder is just full of really good benefits. First off, it's counted as a fey creature rather than humanoid, which means it's immune to humanoid-only spells, like Hold Person, and it gives all kind of random protection against a lot of different kinds of creatures and spells, although the most notable one is definitely Hold Person. It has a baseline movement speed of 35 feet, which is kind of crazy because it's not the only race that has a 35 movement speed, but all the other races that do have 35 movement speed obtain it as like a selling point of that race, like the Wood Elf or the Mark of Passage Human. The Seder just kind of gets it on top of having one of the best racials in the game, that being Magic Resistance. Magic Resistance gives the Seder advantage on all saving throws against spells and magical effects. Magical Resistance is a very common trait given to boss monsters because of how good it is at protecting them from being one-shot by spells. It's not really something that's easily obtainable for players. In fact, you have to take a legendary item, the Robes of the Archmage, in order to get this on a player. So it's basically a legendary tier ability that satyrs get on top of also just having 35 movement speed for some reason and immunity to a whole bunch of humanoid specific spells and abilities. 
They also have the standard ability scores, proficiencies and persuasion, one of the best skills, and can jump an extra 1d8 feet when they do a standing jump. I'm not sure if they tried to make this satyr broken on purpose, but I can definitely see why a lot of people ban satyrs from their games, especially for that magic resistance alone. The only real downside to the satyr is that it doesn't have dark vision. And at number 3, we have the Yon T Pure Blood. Now, did you want to have magical resistance, but also dark vision? Well, then, the Yuton Pure Blood is the race for you, as this is the only other race in the game that has magical resistance as one of its racial traits which, as I've explained, is kind of a legendary tier ability to have. It also has the good old dark vision, so you don't really give up anything for that. But it doesn't have the amazing 35 movement speed of the satyr, nor being treated as a different type besides humanoid. But what separates the Yonti pure blood from the satyr is its extra resistances, or I guess I should say immunity. The Yonti pure blood has poison immunity. It's just straight up immune to poison damage and the poison condition the only ratio in the game that gives you an immunity to a damage type. And poison damage is a pretty common type of damage from NPCs. Now, the ASMR is on this list for having two resistances, which no other races have. Having immunity is better than resistance. In addition, it has racial spells that it can cast just like the Tiefling's Infernal Legacy trait, where at first level it knows the Poison Spray Cantrip and has the ability to cast Aminal Friendship an unlimited number of times, but it can only be used on snakes which allows you to charm a snake for 24 hours if it fails the saving throw set by your charisma. And at third level, it gains the ability to cast a suggestion spell once every long rest. Now, I made a video on the best utility spells in the game, and suggestion made it at number six on that list. It's an incredibly useful spell that I've even heard some games online say that they banned it because it's too good, as it basically allows you to mind control someone in a very specific way for eight hours. As if they fail a wisdom saving throw, they have to listen to whatever one sentence command you give them as long as it doesn't result in their death. So you can use it to just tell a guard to go home if you want to escape a sticky situation, for example. So getting it once a day for free is super good. So with all of these really good benefits, what's the downside of the Yonti Pure Blood? Well, it's not its ability scores because it has the normal plus two and plus one. It's actually its alignment because technically, the Yonti Pure Blood are typically neutral evil. You can totally just ignore the alignment and reap all the benefits of the Pure Blood, though. But that's really the only downside they have. The Pure Bloods are kinda broken, even more so than the Satyr. Generally, the Pure Blood and Variant Human are banned in a lot of homebrew games. And at number two, we have the Variant Human. The Human has two variants that it can be, where it can either be the Standard Human, which gives them an impressive plus one to all of their ability scores, giving it the highest amount of total ASI increases that a race can have, or you can pick Variant Human, which only gives you a plus one to two of your ability scores, but also allows you to pick any feat you want. And it's the feat availability that makes it the most picked race in the game. If we were to assign scores to racial traits to determine which ones are better than others by giving them a uh, numerical value, we could say resistance to a common type of damage, like fire or poison, is probably worth a 4 out of 10. Pretty good. Being able to have a plus 1 AC bonus is more like an 8 out of 10. Pack Tactics would get a similar score. And being able to pick any feat of your choice is like a 20 out of 10. It's just so good of a trait that it almost blows all the other ones out of the water. If we were to use that same scale though, Magic Resistance would be something like a 19 out of 10, and 30 feet of fly speed would probably be a 16 out of 10. So some of the traits are just way more valuable than others, and being able to pick up a feat is definitely one of them. If you want to know how powerful a feat can be, I suggest watching my video on the top 10 best feats. Even if I might have gotten one or two things wrong, like how you can just use a one-handed crossbow in order to use the crossbow expert's bonus attack. But other than a few minor hiccups, most of the information is pretty spot on. And the feats are varied enough where they're useful to pretty much every single class. You could take something like Sharpshooter on a bow using class to give you incredible amounts of extra damage. Or you just take Lucky to have one of the most overpowered feats in the game. Although one of the best things about being able to take a feat is the ability score increases it gives. A lot of the feats, like Observant, give you really good abilities while also giving a plus one to a certain ability score. So you could just take one of those and basically not lose any bonus when it comes to the ASI increase as the Variant Human only gives you a plus one to two different ability scores. And this variability is what made the Variant Human so useful for so many different kinds of builds and specs. 
Variant Human allowed you to pick an ability score increase in any two different ability scores you had, before they added the Customize Your Origin rule. And also, being able to pick any feat meant that Variant Human was pretty much the best race to pick for all classes, because it just allowed you to kind of do whatever you wanted. The Human also got a proficiency in any one skill of your choice, which helped further along how versatile the Human Racial's abilities could be. Before Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, there wasn't really a better race you could pick than the Variant Human, because getting a free feat at level 1 is just that powerful. And at number 1, we have Tasha's Custom Lineage from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Now, Tasha's Custom Lineage is different from the Customize Your Origin rule, as Customize Your Origin can be applied to all races and basically allows you to pick whatever ability points and proficiencies you want, with a few restrictions. And Tasha's Custom Lineage is a race you can pick that allows you to be whatever you want, and is not eligible for the Customize Your Origin rule, because it already allows you to pick whatever ability scores you want. So with Tasha's custom lineage, basically you're treated as a humanoid type, so you don't gain any benefits like the satyr of being a different type of creature. Your size can be small or medium. Your walking speed is always a standard 30 feet, so no increases to 35 like the satyr. You get a plus two ability score increase to any one of your ability score of your choice, instead of a plus one to two different scores like the variant human. You get to pick either dark vision, or a proficiency in any one skill of your choice, and finally you get to pick one feat that you qualify for, in addition to a language of your choice as you get that plus common. Now Tasha's custom lineage exists basically if you want to play a homebrew race, where if you want to play something that's like a half orc, a half elf, and a half human, since that wouldn't exist in one of the D&D standard races. And it's customizable enough by basically just copying the variant human template that it can easily fit whatever playstyle you want. And I think it unintentionally became the best racial thing you can pick, because of one of the downsides to the Variant Human was that it didn't have dark vision, and Tasha's custom lineage allows you to pick that up. But the real thing that makes it better than the Variant Human is that plus two ability score increase. You see, some of the feats allow you to get a half ability score, like the Observant feat allows you to increase your wisdom or intelligence by plus one. So, if you pick Observant and pick Wisdom, and then you use your Racial plus 2 Ability score on Wisdom as well, this can allow you to start off with 18 in your Wisdom score at level 1, which makes it the only race you can pick in the game that allows you to start off with an 18 in one of your Ability scores. This is impossible the Variant Human because it forces you to distribute its Ability scores evenly, but Tasha's Custom Lineage allows you to dump both of those points into one stat, and then pick a feat that allows you to get another one, which can allow you to start off with 18 at whatever your best stat is. Now, technically, the Mountain Dwarf is still the king when it comes to getting a plus two to two separate ability scores, but Tasha's Custom Lineage is the only one that allows you to get a plus three in one of them. Even if you don't try to cheese with the plus three strategy, just being able to pick any feat is still super good, just like with the Variant Human, in addition to the fact that you get Dark Vision as well. There's also the RP benefits that can make your race whatever you want, if you really want to play a Dragonborn but don't want to use the garbage racials of the Dragonborn, you could just use Tasha's custom lineage and become stronger than a varied human while basically just being a Dragonborn. Or if you want to be an elf to get the elven accuracy feat, you can just pick custom lineage and qualify that way for the feat at level 1. So when it comes to combat usefulness and RP, I think Tasha's custom lineage kind of wins out in both departments because you can't really get more creative than just being able to pick whatever you want. All right, and that's the list. Now, just a reminder, I made this assuming your DM allows you to use the Customize Your Origin rule, which is why the Mountain Dwarf is pretty decent with its plus two to two stats. But even if you can't use that rule, all the other spots are still really good for the racials nonetheless. And the top two spots don't really need that rule anyway to be just as strong as described. So. Like always, if you have any ideas for future videos just like this one, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments.